Ashok Ganderdeen is Professor and Chair of Philosophy at Haverford College in Pennsylvania, where he's taught for the past 39 years. He was the first director of the Margaret Jess Center for Cross-Cultural Study of Religion at Haverford and has participated in numerous professional conferences on inter-religious dialogue and East-West comparative philosophy. His primary concern throughout his career has been to clarify the universal logos, or common ground, at the heart of human reason and rational life. He's founder director of the Global Dialogue Institute, which seeks to embody the dialogical powers of global reason in all aspects of cultural life. His latest book, The Awakening of the Global Mind, further develops these themes for the general reader. He's focused over the past four decades on tapping and clarifying the deeper common ground between diverse cultural, religious and ideological worlds. In his many published essays and public lectures, he's attempted to demonstrate that human reason is essentially global, dialogical, holistic and intercultural. In his books, he's attempted to demonstrate that there is a fundamental logos or universal grammar underlying all cultures, religions, philosophies and ideologies. This discovery and clarification of the fundamental logos in human cultures, experience and life has important implications for effectively addressing the most pressing practical problems humans face today. His Global Dialogue Institute has developed a powerful whole child education pilot project that's been supported by UNICEF and the Ministry of Education in Indonesia. This integral approach to education and teacher training uses the power of deep dialogue to renovate the teaching and learning ecology of education. While his earlier books attempt to demonstrate that human reason is essentially grounded in the fundamental logos that is the common ground between diverse worlds, the awakening attempts to communicate these findings to everyday people who have no background in philosophy and urgently need to understand and cope with the profound changes we now face in the globalization of our cultures. He is co-convener of the recently formed World Commission on Global Consciousness and Spirituality, which brings eminent world leaders together in sustained, deep dialogue to cultivate global vision and wisdom for the new millennium. Ashok Ganderdeen, Professor and Chair of Philosophy at Haverford College, joins me on In Discussions, Crossing Over the Bridge. Welcome to In Discussion today and Crossing Over the Bridge, the 31st program in the series. And it is a great privilege to be talking to Professor Ashok Ganderdeen, Professor of Philosophy at Haverford College in Pennsylvania. Ashok, welcome to you. Thank you so much for having me on this conversation, David. A pleasure to be with you. Likewise, a great pleasure. We shared some notes prior to the programming, and I think as agreed going forward, this set the scene as an introduction. And what I would like to do, if I may, is begin by looking back for the benefit of the listeners at your earlier days perhaps even looking at your childhood, where you resided, your memories of that, and then working forwards through academia to where we can talk about the current day issues that we have spoken about. So with that in mind, could we, for the listeners, go back to school days and your recollections of life then? Yes, that's a great way to begin, and we'll see as the conversation unfolds that there are deep connections. I, I was born in Trinidad in the West Indies, a family from India, and that's a significant fact as we'll see down the road. And uh, I hadn't been to India until uh, I arrived at Haverford College, which is founded by the Quakers here outside of Philadelphia. In 1971, my first visit to India, I was born in 1941. I'm now 70 years old. Born in Trinidad, first five years, then on to Jamaica, Kingston. We happened to live next to Marley, Bob Marley's family. We didn't know it at the time. Then we came to New York. The family was en route to England. The dream was to go to England, mother country of the Commonwealth, so to speak. But 
on, in America, my father was uh, teaching yoga very early, way back in 1948-49. I arrived when I was 10 years old in New York City uh, in 1951-52. And uh, the family lived in New York for a while. And uh, I started, obviously, I had my early schooling in Jamaica in the British church school, a British style. And uh, came to New York and then picked up my education there. In New York City, I grew up in New York, so to speak. Family eventually settled in Phoenix, Arizona, way back in the mid-50s and have been there ever since. And so my early education, first of all, when I arrived in the country, I was beaten as a boy in school. Uh, once I did a math exam, everything seemed right, all of the six sums. I looked at the board and I saw they were all correct and yet they were all marked wrong on my paper. And you had to line up to get flogged uh, with a cane for everyone you got wrong. And I saw the injustice of that. I was traumatized and I got flogged and, uh, and my holding out my arms. And, uh, and my parents, when I got home, I was in tears. They paid not much attention and that was just what it was. And I mentioned that because when I came to New York uh, and entered the first time going to school, I was uh, hopping up the steps and a monitor stopped me and took me to the principal's office. I assumed that was a headmaster, and he, he or she would have a strap or a cane and would start to flog me for misbehaving in a way I didn't understand. And I sat down in the principal's office and I said to him, are you going to beat me? And he said, no, we don't beat in this country. I said, you don't? He said, no, go back to your, your classroom and take one step at a time. I was so thrilled. I jolted out of the room. I took three steps at a time up the steps to get to my room. It was a turning point in my life because I felt finally I was in a place where I wouldn't be flogged for in my learning. And uh, that was just an early memory uh, of, of things unfolding in New York City, going through uh, into junior high school and then uh, into high school. And uh, eventually, and I became the president of my high school, which is where the Lincoln Center now is. And I went on to City College of New York. If you earned a high enough average, you could get in. And I just got in a three point seven, you know, 87 point something average to get a free education in college. As my family moved on to Phoenix, I stayed in New York and went to call, uh, City College, which was then considered a proletarian Harvard. It was the highest level of education that you could get without having to pay tuition if you qualified. And I was very thrilled to have an education. And eventually, even though my father said in a very autocratic way, become an electrical engineer, quite arbitrarily, because I was great in science and math, uh, I cut my classes and went in to sit in on philosophy because it called me. And eventually I was put on probation for not attending my other classes and had to prove myself and come back. And then I majored in philosophy. And when I did, and just to wrap up this phase of the early story, I realized to be a philosopher, I would have to listen to uh, you know Lord Russell and uh, Peter Strawson and the great... Anglo-American philosophers in analytic philosophy, Alfred North Whitehead, Wittgenstein, that I would have to master analytic logic if I'm going to enter philosophy. Even though that wasn't my primary call, I was being called deep in my heart to enter the universal light, to listen to that light, and which would be a moral, spiritual call of loving Sophia, philosophia, the feminine energy of wisdom. And so I decided I would have to get a doctorate, I'd have to teach philosophy, and I felt I would love that. And it would take me 10 years to go through all of the stages to do this, but I was willing to do it. And that's my early journey. That's an interesting point that you raised there with Sophia. And I'm sure that we will travel to that. This is a journey from a very early age that is seeing the world in a very different way, I may suggest. Absolutely right. And... Looking back at the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and what I'm reading from this is that you are transitioning from a, what I would call a almost a Victorian British colonial existence or background into an American background from which you find clearly, in a way, a safe haven compared to where you had been with that school system. Exactly right. But looking at that, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and I know that we're going into a type of left-brain analytical approach here, but let's do it anyway before we move on. How do you view 
the 50s, 60s and 70s in terms of our evolution in the sense of a, a political arena, a, a religious arena, an ideological sense. How do you view those decades? Do you mean in terms of myself uh, f regarding me or my sense of my ecology and the culture at large? I think both contextually in yourself growing up, in mm. how you viewed the way that the world was shifting. And uh, if I look at the 1950s, I can very basically talk about the Cold War, the increase in demand, the consumerism. The, the 60s speaks for itself. The, the 70s moves into an increasing global village. And then we move forward into uh, the world that we have today, which is very marked by uh, commercialism, consumerism, etc. Looking back in retrospect, how did you view those decades? That's a great question. And uh, arriving here in the early 50s, Eisenhower is the president. My father is uh, teaching yoga at the YMCA in New York uh, City. We are there uh, in transit on the way to England on a visitor's visa. So we'd never had a sense of home. But arriving in a New York City and just looking up at Macy's as I left uh, Pennsylvania Station and the Empire State Building and the taxis and and the, the, it was a, like a magic because in Jamaica I used to listen to uh, the Western music, uh, you know, country music on the radio and I loved it. And here I am, an uh, immigrant boy arriving in the big city with a family just getting started and the, the, it was a sense of that uh, wonderment of, of arriving, on, uh, you know, of so many, the story of so many immigrant families coming with a sense of the land of opportunity. Uh, anything is possible now. The sky is the limit. If you really uh, grab your bootstraps and you have the, the discipline and the, and the ambition and the vision, there's no stopping you. That, that, that was very much the ambiance of my, my boyhood uh, in those days. And we, there was a television in the neighbors uh, downstairs where we rented and they allowed us to come in and watch. And that was so magical to see the Lone Ranger and listen to the radio to Batman and, and see the comic books. And it was an amazing sense of, uh, of abundance and food galore and, and opportunities. It was just, uh, that was a very much a mystique of the early 50s, uh, despite the sense of the Cold War and sirens were being sounded in New York City and spotlights were shining in the skies at night as if we were looking out for possible bombings and a sense of paranoia in the air. And as a boy, back to the West Indies, I was growing up in two cultures, family at home having a, a Hindu a cultural sense, not so much religious, but cultural, but sending us to a church, Christian school, and to church as well, to be uh, in the culture, to be acculturated. I had a sense of living between worlds. And that would be, stay with me all the way through in trying to solve the question, how do you find yourself between worlds? And that will come up later on. We go into the 60s, and I'm a young student uh, and uh, just graduating out of college in 62 as a philosophy major. And there's Bob Dylan, and soon the Beatles would arrive, and assassination of John Kennedy. And then his brother is assassinated, Martin King, folk music. The, the revolution is on. And uh, Elvis Presley came out in the 50s. And these are things that in your Richter scale, you just measure the sense of the culture unfolding. And when we hit the 50s, it was an amazing time. Uh, you know, drugs all around, smoking, uh, you know, pot, and LSD and all of these things. And people just letting loose, thawing. And the songs of Dylan would just rip through the culture like a call out of the blue before the Beatles arrived uh, at JFK Airport, which was, uh, had a different name by then. That was the ambiance of the 60s, a sense of, my God, th there's a change in the culture. There's a cultural revolution emerging. Feminist themes were coming up about uh, the liberation of women in the culture and so forth. And that's when I was uh, getting my doctorate at Brandeis University from 65 to 68, uh, which is a whole other story. And so as the, the, the war in Vietnam and the protests in the culture, I had to deeply in my soul ask, do I stay in my office and study Spinoza or do I go out and protest and join the others? And it was a huge spiritual decision. And I realized that my calling as a philosopher was a spiritual activism and I had to stay put and not 
to leave and abandon my graduate studies to go out and protest. It was either or for me, and I had two daughters already, by the way. My first daughter was born when I was 20, an undergraduate. I fell in love with this beauty, beautiful young lady in junior high school, uh, and my heart was with her, and we never talked for four or five years. I was too shy. We ended up in, co- in high school together. We sat next to each other for two, three years, and it's only in my senior year when I became president of the school and she was the head cheerleader that we opened the dance. And it was like the West Side story unfolding in terms of a love story. And uh, uh, we got married. Uh, I had to elope. My father wouldn't give permission uh, when I was 20. And uh, a year later, my first daughter, Kumari, was born. I was an undergraduate sophomore uh, at that time and faced the whole world disowned by my father for disobedience. And uh, soon a second daughter is on the way. And uh, on my undergraduate years as a philosophy major, I had to support uh, and co-support working late at night uh, my, my young babies, so to speak. So that was all part of the mix. Uh, so all through the 60s, I had daughters growing up. And I arrived after, at the end of my doctorate in 1968 at Haverford College, which apparently was seen as a monumental achievement because Haverford, I didn't know it at the time, founded by the Quakers, uh, it was considered one of the top colleges in the, in the nation. And when I came down to be interviewed, I didn't even know it. And after I got the offer, people said, were amazed that I was going to Haverford College. It was like a prize of all prizes. And uh, so from 68 till the present, 44 years I've been here at the college. I'd like to ask you, and we will move on in a minute, just bear with me. The way that I look at the world is, is I can talk about any civilization going back 5,000 years. We know that we are in a huge evolutionary process today, and I talk about it as being entering in very early terms into a new epoch. But I look back and always ask that question, by the way, because I look back at 1945 and I think that it started something unknowingly with the nuclear bomb, with that conflict that has shaped very much our world ever since. And I say that because civilizations in the past have suffered from a hubris when they implode, whether it's a hubris in politics or in business or in science and technology. But it's, to me, 1945 was almost the beginning of a hubris for us uh, in that technology that has, to a great extent, steered us to where we are today. Is that something that you recognized as a student and then moving into professional life? Was that something that was on your mind? Did you look at it that way at all? Well, that's a great question. And uh, so I hear two strands of this in terms of the hubris of the past civilizations that came and, 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 and perished for whatever reason because of hubris connected with a more ego-based uh, arrogance and, and not honoring the source whence we're supported and funded and, and, and gifted. So that was always in the background. I, I, I would rather say that through that period of growing up, there was a sense of the joy of technology. It, it was not, even though I understood the danger of the, of the, of the nuclear uh, p- possibilities and reality in terms of Hiroshima, and it was lurking there, and the Cold War, uh, and, you know, for example, the Cuban Missile Crisis that came up in the early 60s with John F. Kennedy and, and the, 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 the Soviet Union, all of that was there. The dangers were there, but it, it wasn't a sense, as I have come to have over the decades, of, of the two faces of technology. It was rather that how wonderful technology is. Look at television, what a miracle it is. And this, of course, is before the computer and Internet and all that would accelerate into the end of the 20th century and now in the 21st century, shaping our, the, the, the mindscape and culturescape in enormous ways uh, in this revolution and shift that you're rightly pointing to. So at that point, I think uh, as a young person, it was not really a, uh, being attuned to the sense of the specter of technology as much as the joy and the bliss of what it can do. And uh, it was only as I developed more literacy uh, arriving as a young professor 
and beginning to get a sense of uh, the global condition and the wisdom of our great teachers. And in that respect, a retrospect over 3,000 years, let's say, of the diagnostic of that hubris in the human condition that can take us down, that I began to get a sense of the enormity of the shift that we're facing. Just to take one step back, I was extremely interested in your statement over this choice point that you needed to make in regards to studying, continuing and focusing because of the responsibilities of a young family over an involvement in the protest movements that we saw in the 60s. And I'm interested because in my work, there have been a lot of camps pushing me to get involved and to discuss the protest movements today. I've elected at this stage not to get involved until I can create a better narrative. But it almost seems in that event that there is a choice point and that it is cyclical to some extent over the way that you describe those years and the events that we have today. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I think retrospectively, I don't regret it in the least because I've come to see working with world leaders in the World Commission on Global Consciousness, which I co-founded, or the World Wisdom Council with Irvin Lazo that I co-chair, the evolutionary leaders uh, with whom I'm working, uh, really top uh, minds at the forefront of culture, all concerned with the shift and the crises on the planet. It's become more and more clear that the, perhaps the greatest power in terms of activism is to tend to the, the way we use our consciousness because the greatest wisdom of the planet points to paying attention to our technology of consciousness as the greatest causal force shaping our living realities. And uh, so that the, the, the most profound activism to tend to the great shift we're facing now is to help our cultures become keenly aware of how we're using our consciousness to make our worlds and therefore to shift it to a sustainable culture. And of course, we certainly are presented with a great opportunity now versus any opportunities that may have been available to us in the 60s. Do you have any ideas as to why we are presented with that now over and above uh, those opportunities that they may have had back in the 60s? That's another great question, David. I, 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 I've thought about this a great deal because in my journey from the 60s, 70s, 80s, through the 90s into the new century, I've witnessed some dramatic shifts and I realize that as a philosopher here at Haverford, there were things that I was seeing, was seeing back in the 70s and 80s that I was startling to me, but others wouldn't get it and my colleagues wouldn't get it. There was a, a rupture at Haverford College uh, where the African-American students took over the president's office in the early 70s. And uh, I remember that uh, I came here at 68. And so it was my fourth year here and just came back from India. And the students of, in the culture felt that uh, Gangadeen was keenly tuning into how we cross worlds, how we communicate across different lenses and mindsets and worldviews. And when they felt on campus that were, there was discrimination and they were not part of the community and they occupied the president's office, the only faculty member they would bring in to hear their words and take it to the faculty and administration was me. And ABC News was on the campus and is there racism at Haverford, a Quaker founded institution? This is outrageous. What's going on? The trauma of diversity began to unfold in the mid 70s, meaning how are we coping with other worlds, other perspectives, other cultures, other religions? are we with feminist views? So it really opened up. Haverford was then an all-male institution, all, only students, only male students, about 450 and about 60 faculty members, uh, one or two faculty in quotes of color, uh, one woman or two. And it opened up dramatically after that in the, in the 60s and 70s uh, and into the 80s. And it was a trauma for the culture to deal with diversity. Can you retain unity and community in the midst of real diversity? And I'm saying that because the post-trauma of the ruptures of diversity at all levels and the expansion of the college to triplet size, 50% uh, roughly women students, double the size of faculty, uh, what an enormous 
bursting out uh, in that uh, multiplicity of, of cultures and perspectives. And I realized that that was almost a prerequisite. The postmodern revolution in culture of accentuating alterity and diversity was almost a prerequisite before I feel my voice could be heard, which is to honor diversity and seek dialogue to reconstitute community in the midst of that celebration of diversity. I feel that can be heard now. And with the internet and all of the ways that the global village accelerated through technology and positive side of technology to bring the planet together in the power of the internet, which we're using right now. And this created a whole new political space and the empowerment of people and access to people and people having voices to go viral through the internet. It allows the technology to help the possibility of the shift in consciousness and intelligence towards the new culture. Finally, we are in a position where we can reach each other in a whole new expanded and dilated political space. I'm going to ask this question. The 60s, if you look at it in theological terms, very much about the postmodern think tanks. And I believe that that offered complications in ideological terms, which I don't believe that we have those types of concerns today. They don't appear to be here today. And these types of issues came up particularly around the time when you had the Gandhis and the Kings and the JFKs. It was an ideology that was almost a confusion in society. Possibly we don't have that today because there is a, a greater acknowledgement or a greater focus on technology, which is steering us away from those issues. I, th I think you're onto something, but I would put it slightly differently that the opening up of the issues and challenges of diversity at Haverford was just a micro tip of the iceberg across the academy and across the culture. And certainly something in the, in the last four decades of the 20th century that shifted was a new ethos, postmodern ethos. Postmodern here means modernism was looking at we hold these truths to be self-evident, a kind of universalist a perspective on culture, a presumption of reason. And then postmodern saying, look, diversity is important, different cultures, the, the Latino, the African-American, the Asian, feminists, all have different perspectives. Science is just one amongst them. And we have to honor diversity of perspectives and lenses. And so that ethos of multiplicity, the ethos of diversity, at the first early stage has uh, erupted and, and shifted the landscape and mindscape of our culture. It's true. But I don't think so much its technology has distracted us from from the, 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 the repercussions of that, I call it the trauma of diversity, not to just put it in a negative light, because it was also, it is a great opportunity and a necessity actually to respect diversity, because now it's recognized that America is a multicultural society, multi-perspective. But the flip side of that, that is in our face, is that if the democracy is the power to the people, we the people, and to be a we the people we need, ethos of dialogue, which is to stand in respectful, facing each other in an open space, in our diversity, to allow the possibility of meeting and, and conversation for us to be we the people, then it's a threat to the vi vibrancy of a real democracy. And I think we're facing that crisis deeply now, but there's almost a, a lack of awareness of how to diagnose it, how to understand it, what's the problem, why is the civic space broken? Why are we in power plays rather than in dialogue and, 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 and holding we the people together? E pluribus unum. Have we lost our way? Well, that's across the culture and across the academy. The academy, to me, is shattered, I think, by radical diversity and having lost a sense of the human technology, the technology of deep dialogue, to really find our way to rebuild a new sense of community uh, and, and polity. Uh, in the 21st century. That, to me, is part, a symptom of the great uh, crisis we're facing. And my question was not well set out, so I apologize if I was ambiguous. But following on from that point, and then we will return back to the center of the road, we're talking about a paradox in a way, and I'm referring now to the Internet as an engine of global information. Because whilst it 
assists us. It helps us. It helps to spread a message. It has certainly had its place with the protest movements all the way from Arabic, the Arabic Spring onwards. But almost with that engine, there's no uh, validity in some cases or due diligence in some cases where there is so much information. It almost, to me, offers a sort of ADD for people. There's too much to choose from. And there's not enough diligence as to how to place that out, how to find out through this due diligence what is correct, what is good for people, what is, what is good in serving a democracy, whilst taking much of that information from the Internet and actually deciding uh, through... Uh, some type of mechanism that it doesn't serve the people. So there is a paradox in a way. Would you concur with that? Absolutely, I do. That was well said. And I felt your earlier version of the question had some ambiguity, but it was on this theme, and I tried to resonate with that. And the sense of due diligence and the paradox of Internet power is, is a great symptom of what we're talking about, because the over-flooding of information and being overwhelmed with cultural ADD, which I like, uh, is a term I use myself, the, the ego-based culture, ego-mental culture, the using, and this is, this is going to come up later in our conversation, I'm sure, but our great wisdom teachers across the ages have been insisting that if we stay re and remain within an ego-based way of thinking, mental technology, it inherently fragments and creates ADD, cultural ADD, academic ADD, you're going to have broken compartments of information. And students, the analog to what you're saying in the living form is that students coming into a liberal arts fragmented compartmentalism, a departmentalism of knowledge, it, 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 we may not have made a link, but this, that's a reflection of the dominance of an ego-based identity thinking that objectifies and fragments and packages. So when we get the internet that can, it's as good as we, we can make it, it could be a great tool for dialogue and, and linking and movements and uh, uh, your liberation of the people and, uh, and enlightenment to the people. Or it can be an overwhelming, if we don't know how to use it, and we don't have the lens of the mind to be discriminating and discerning, it will overrun us with so much information that we will just be swallowed up and lost and have no perspective. So I totally resonate to your sense of the paradox of this technology. This is where I'm going to look later, and I'm very interested in this, in the dialogical thinking, because in that you're also talking about a new language, it's, which is what I, I so yearn for with these programs in creating a new language. Before I do that, and just staying on track, I was brought up by a wonderful uncle who... Uh, was very well versed in the Greek civilization and many others. And I'm, I'm on track here. And what I'm trying to do now, now that we have looked at recent times, probably the last six decades, is I'd like to have your perspective in building this narrative of looking back to those civilizations, looking at their scientific, their cultural, their social advances, their capabilities, and place that into context with where we're today. Because I very much believe that those civilizations were in many ways much better armed than we are today, much more civilized in some ways and calculating. And I wonder how you look back to those civilizations in your work in learning from them when you're teaching, how we can better be armed by informing ourselves, uh, educating ourselves with those civilizations and where they were scientifically in terms of technology and in terms of their social interaction? That's a great question. Uh, my early training at Brandeis was in logic, analytical logic, uh, Anglo-American philo philosophical logic of language. Uh, Russell, Whitehead, Wittgenstein, post-Frega, 
and my mentor at Brandeis, Professor Summers, who was really a genius logician, his uh, great work came out in Oxford in 1982, The Logic of Natural Language. I was his research assistant in a three-year fellowship at, at, at Brandeis. Uh, I was trained in logic, and logic goes, and he was trying to show that the, the modern logic should not eclipse Aristotle's logic. Getting back to the Greek uh, logos, the, the ancient uh, Greek tradition, to pick up on your question, since you said your uncle, I believe, w w was steeped in the, the Greek tradition, that is the, sh the roots of the European journey in the deep in the logos, both in Ju the Judaic tradition, uh, Abraham and Moses, uh, through Jesus, and, and uh, the logos before Socrates, the great hero of the European tradition, uh, the teacher of Plato, uh, uh, before so Socrates, these, these genius minds were trying to see into the ultimate causes of things. The birth of science and philosophy were one. Wisdom was science at that point. There was no divorce between them. And they were trying to see the ultimate starting point or arche or principles that explain the multiplicity of culture and world and the universe around us until Socrates came on the scene and his revolution was to turn it not to nature and trying to understand the external universe, but to the self, know thyself above all, according to Socrates. But the common factor, David, was the logos out of the Greek, uh, the, the great word of the origin of speech and the light of reason and language, uh, the whole rational power of the mind traces back to the logos, the, the fundamental field out of which uh, speech and language and world emerges so that the wisdom tradition, the philosophia, the love of Sophia, uh, of my profession, uh, coming through Plato, the student of Ar uh, Socrates and Aristotle, who was uh, the brilliant student of Plato, were shaping the grammar that would really resonate through Europe over the centuries. And so when I look at that uh, origin, uh, I do teach Aristotle's logic and ontology, metaphysics, and Socrates, and his, the great dialogues of Plato, to really understand the, the, the brilliant attempts of that science and culture to frame the, the language of a democracy, the Republic of, of Plato and so forth, beautifully rich at the early stages of trying to decode the Logos. It was later, that was my original training in the European logic and, and, and ontology. But when I went to India in the 70s, when I first, for my first journey and began to encounter the Bhagavad Gita and, and discovered in the dialogue of Lord Krishna and Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, this great text of the Hindu tradition, and back before that into the Vedas, and to understand the Patanjali and the yoga philosophy, I was stunned at what I discovered because I discovered a split deep in the logic of the European tradition between Aristotle and the modern mathematical logic. That was my, 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 my trauma, really, to discover how can logic be split and polarized. When I went to India, uh, in t attempting to take a break from all of this and to study sitar and music and lecture at the University of Pune on my findings in logic in the West and discovering the Gita, it was a breakthrough for me and a turning point in my life because I began to see, wait a minute, Krishna, this voice speaking out of the Om field, that is a deeper field in the Hindu tradition, not the locus, but the Om, the, the Atman, the Brahman and a great science of meditative thinking, which I didn't understand until I opened it up then, saw that if you, to Arjuna, the warrior of the broken field of his family in a war, the dialogue was amazing and stunning because Krishna was saying, you've got to step out of the ego sphere where you're going to have bro brokenness in war, Arjuna, and rise in the science and technology of yoga into the space of the Om, where yourself, the Atman, and that was the title of Mahatma Gandhi, Maha Atman, great Atman, great self, is the title of a Gandhi, to be in that self. That was a great technology. And I, I wondered, why didn't I get this exposure as a, as a PhD student uh, in philosophy? No acquaintance whatsoever with uh, Hindu thought. And then I discovered Buddha's great awakening, uh, you know, 2,500 years ago. Oh, when Buddha, a Hindu prince, discovered the great four axioms, the four noble truths, and revamped the whole language of enlightened wisdom, again, seeing that ego-based place is a place of suffering, and that we have a choice to rehabilitate our minds into the integral space of the unified field. So I began to see that meditative intelligence was gaining access technologically to the unified field, whether you call it Om or Shunyata, emptiness. And then, of course, I moved into China and saw the Tao Te Ching and Lao Tzu beginning his great Tao Te Ching, the Tao, 
calculus that the Tao that is named in ordinary ways is not the Tao. So this was a revolution for me. And I was excited when I came back in 1972, said to my colleagues at Haverford, I must start teaching Indian philosophy and logic. Uh, and they reluctantly uh, nodded and acquiesced. And that started decades of work leading to my first major book, Meditative Reason, which was like a, a strange thing to say. How can meditative intelligence and technology illuminate the logos and the, the logic and reason? Could that be possible? Is there a deep logic for humanity? So over these decades, to answer your question, I began to see the resources of these great civilizations. I saw Abraham in a new light that when the call of the first, if all of these great geniuses were seeing there is something first and primal, however we name it. If it's Yahweh, then Yahweh calls upon us in the deepest way. If it's Om, it calls us. If it's emptiness, it calls us. If it's Tao, if it's Allah, it calls us. And what is the response of humans? To honor it. And if we honor it, what happens? We can't privilege our own agenda and our own local lens. We must open up and go into this deeper space. And so I spent decades trying to inquire, is that great technology across these genius early attempts, attempting to open and civilize the space into the logosphere? I didn't even have a word for a common word, and I had to be very careful. I couldn't call it the Ohm sphere or the Allah space or the Yahweh space. I had to tiptoe, and I chose the Greek logos because I'm a logician. And all sciences are logos based. That's when you say psycho logos, you get the psycho science because logos brings the science. So I was choosing that more ecumenical vocabulary for the fundamental field. When we talk about logos, I think immediately about Muhammad, Zoroaster, Krishna, Jesus. And I think this is why I'm going back to those civilizations. They were spiritually, to me, wrong or right, and you may wish to correct me, but spiritually there was an acute awareness, very much, I believe, this unity consciousness. And to take that one step further, and this may not be appropriate, but possibly this is where a duality comes into our evolution, that we in some way lose that. And if you fast forward to the late 1600s with the Industrial Revolution, it speaks for itself of where human beings have gone. We've gone into this material world, which certainly pushed us further away over the last 300 years. But this is why I ask about the Greeks as much as the Byzantines. And, and yes, you can look at Genesis, you can read about Abraham. There was so much evidence back there to suggest that not only spiritually were they so armed with this <coughs> wisdom, but also that they were scientifically, probably scientifically beyond even what we're aware of today, I think it goes hand in hand. I think the genius of these great traditions, when you say unity consciousness, remember, we now can look back and, and open up a space and connect the, the Greek logos and the Yahweh tradition and the Christ event and the Mohammed Allah unfolding and the Tao and the Om and the Shunyata and even the science's attempt to get to the unified field, the brilliance of an Einstein trying to get into the unified field and get the vocabulary. All of these traditions were in effect resonating out of a common source, but our mystical uh, seers all through the ages across all the culture were seeing that there is one ultimate wisdom. That was a perennial wisdom. But we didn't have the technology to demonstrate it. We didn't have the ways to bring those alternative languages together into a common space. And this is what my life work has been, to tap that logosphere and bring out the, the, the global lens and the global scripting that allows us to now say, let's, let's show it. Let's show how Buddha's wisdom and Krishna's wisdom and Jesus's wisdom and the wisdom of Abraham and Moses and of Muhammad and the Sufi tradition and the Tao and the scientific evolution, they resonate out of a deep logic. That is a new frontier.
even though somehow we knew it. So I would rather word what you present so beautifully as that all of these geniuses saw and diagnosed in their own way that humanity, insofar as an evolutionary journey, whether it was a fall or a rise, if uh, the, the whole uh, mythos of the fall in the biblical world of Adam and Eve from grace into this eating of the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of grace, that is all a metaphor for falling into the objectifying technology where you privilege your own existence as independent. That's the fall, and that's a condition of sin. If in the beginning we were not there and then we fell into that, or conversely, if humanity is out of the Big Bang, billions of years emerging evolutionary in an evolutionary way into consciousness, out of different forms into, into, into the emergence of conscious beings, then our ego-based stage of technology, of scripting and minding is a journey into the next phase, which is what they have been calling us to come into the Logos script, come into the Sophia space, come into the Om, come into the Christ, come into the space of Allah. So either way, the bottom line common diagnostic is that humanity is in a very painful evolutionary shift from an ego-based technology of culture making and self-making and experience making, which fragments and objectifies and is ultimately the source of profound suffering. And Buddha, for example, saw that clearly and calling us into the higher script. And that is a great challenge and threshold we're facing today. We have no choice. Our sustainability is on the line. We've had the, the meter has, so to speak, reached a point where we have to somehow find the way together to cross into that birthright that our teachers have been calling us into. We talk about, yes, and I had mentioned in the notes that there are many prophecies today. I had mentioned the Mayan prophecies, the end of a 26,000 year calendar, etc., etc. And it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, that when we talk about this egocentric human being or culture or society or planet, we're talking about something that perhaps once was reversed and perhaps again will be reversed. And many will term that as a greater consciousness or a unique consciousness where the ego is eliminated from humankind. There seems to me in life no gray areas or no room for gray areas. It, you either have to go from where we are today from this very egocentric society into one that is about functional giving uh, as a basis for society or you go nowhere because we have reached a, a pinnacle in terms of our challenges in this world. Do you see where we are now as having opportunity to reverse where we've come from for so many thousands of years? That's a beautiful question, David. And uh, there, there are different uh, you know, narratives that we could tap in terms of our recurrence of cycles. Uh, the Mayan is, is uh, one a great one, 26,000 year shift and the sense now of the great 2012 moment imprinted in the astrological alignments is that humanity uh, is, is on the brink, long coming, uh, obviously centuries, uh, millennia coming, of, of, a, of a shift in the dimension of our being uh, from an ego sphere to the logosphere, sphere, to put it that way, or the Akashic field to use the, the Hindu vocabulary. And if we switch over to the, the Bhagavad Gita and the mythology by, by Krishna, that the yugas, the ages, Krishna says, I come into the world, he says to Arjuna, when there's a deterioration of the moral energy and spiritual energy to help alleviate and shift it back in the cycle of the yugas, over, which is like light years of, 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 of cycling, back into uh, an upshift to a higher form of culture. And you get the impression that there are these cycles, you know, in different prophecies, uh, you know, of a, of a high time of, of the path, Atlantis and the mythology there, all the speculations about the pyramids and where did we have extraterrestrial contact all across this planet at an earlier stage that had amazing technology of spiritual flourishing and we've lost it somehow. And, and we need to know how we have no choice but to somehow 
as you put it, the function, functional giving your words to me is that I thou rather than I it technology where the other is an it, whether it's another person or yourself as an object or another culture or religion or worldview where there's violence coming out of that scripting of objectifying one another as an it rather than an I thou to use Buber's language where you enter a sacred space of, of, of Christ consciousness, of Buddha consciousness, of yoga consciousness, where the self and the other are flowing deeply in the zone of sacred space, of functional care. To care for oneself is to care for another, which is the heart of moral consciousness across the planet. All our great moral teachers, if you begin to step back and see, saw some version of the golden rule, which is you and the other are connected. And to functionally care for oneself and care for the other. To care for the other is to care for yourself, including nature, a sacred nature. It really is rising back and awakening to sacred space, which is to enter the space of presence, which is to enter the fundamental field that all of our great geniuses and, and spiritual teachers have been calling us to. You mentioned Atlantis, and Atlantis, from my understanding, fell into a decline because of technological or scientific hubris, at least part of it. And it was also a metaphysical or even possibly another dimension that we can't visualize. But when we're talking about language, and of course there's those in camps who will look at revelations and say, well, yes, this is what's defining us becoming Christ-like. There are so many different views on this. But the reason why I mentioned Atlantis and looking at different realities, different dimensions, is it possible, without over-dissecting this, that in order to reach this world of, let's call it oneness, that we almost will find ourselves going to a different dimension, a different sense of reality, I'm not suggesting that we're all going to lift off from this planet, but that we, that we will need to go into a completely different sphere of being. Is that something that could be a possibility as we move from this very egocentric, male-dominated, material-based world into something that is converse to that or opposes that? That's a great question, David. <clears throat> I think it's absolutely so. I think that our great teachers were clearly aware that when you leave the ego sphere, to use that term, imagine an ego-based person who sees herself himself as a separate, independently existing being and using a mental calculus that gives identity and name tag to everything and everything has its own packet, so to speak, more kind of at atomic kind of thinking and culture making and, and making yourself as a separate entity and each other and so forth. <clears throat> if we call that the materialistic uh, technology, the, the great teachers saw that there is a dimensional shift into the unified field. And it's not that we have to lift off from Earth, it's we have to arrive. The irony is that the user Zen way of looking at this point of a dimensional shift, that a person who is living the ego-based life is calloused and cut off from being in the moment right here, right now, right in this room, right here. I tried to say to the students when we're doing Zen philosophy and we're in Margaret Guest Center 101, Guest 101, G-E-S-T, I asked them to check in as a metaphor. I set their names when they come in. You could, I use single brackets to mark, imagine single brackets to mark the ego's language and double parentheses to mark the language of Zen, the language of Christ, the language of Buddha, the language of Sufi, all of these, the Quaker space, the double parentheses to mark the dimensional shift it's huge, and it's traumatic. Krishna is urging Arjuna, the whole Bhagavad Gita dialogue, is Krishna in the Om sphere, is trying to help Arjuna get the technology, the mental technology of the heart and mind, which is yoga technology, to be able to access the unified field of Om, which surrounds us infinitely right here, right now. So the, the three words to sum up all of that wisdom is be here now. It's not to go to another space, but nirvana, the, the, the primal field, is always closer to us than we are. It's to arrive right here, right now. And that technology is a dimensional shift. It requires a technology of consciousness, a higher level of scripting, an integral calculus, a holistic 
language form and mindset and lens. So when the third eye opens, I call it the first eye, actually. It's a, it's, it's a prejudicial to call it the third eye, as if you want to do three, but it's the first eye, the primal lens of the mind that dilates, and that is the wisdom of the great enlightenment teachers and, uh, and of, 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 of Jesus Christ modeling it when he says, I am the script, I am the logos, I am the way, I am the truth. And the disciples didn't speak that language at first. They were asking from the ego-based language, must I enter my mother's womb again? And he says, for those who have ears, let them hear. Meaning, if you have the double bracket the technology of the Christ language and lens and, and, and eyes, you will see the world in a deeper way right here. But there's no question about it. It's a dimensional shift to enter into the logosphere. And athletes know it when they enter the zone. They have peak moments. It's always calling us and always available. Jazz musicians, when they go into the magic of jazzing, and they step out of the ego music into the jazz and become the music. When lovers become one, the two become one in their two-ness, they're experiencing that momentary being in the zone. So it's very close, it's right here, it's a dimensional shift. I think you're, before we move on here, I think you're also talking to a shift in polarity. If I was going to bring in a semi-scientific thinking or a sacred geometry, uh, or look at the way that our universe is built, the way that you have uniformity through the planets, uh, through the galaxy, that it could be a polarity shift that would shift 180 degrees in order to take us to this non-egotistical way of being. Uh, maybe that is either something that occurs naturally in a cycle that we will witness or it will occur because we take this planet to its greatest extent uh, where mother earth simply as a conscious being itself cannot or can no longer handle the stress and the strains of our place in it as being opposing to all the values that jesus and buddha and others had themselves and were armed with as well said, and this uh, so-called metaphor of polarity, I would suggest a slightly different wording for what, what I hear in this, that the shift to presence from the ego base, which is displaces presence, to allowing presence to appear and to enter into it, to be in the zone, so to speak, is a polar shift, an enormous shift. And what you pointed out in the beginning of the question, what Scientists, physicists, for example, are beginning to see when they discover the fractal universe, every point in this unified field that infinitely surrounds us, let's call it the logosphere uh, or the Sophia sphere, and understand that to be alternative names abound here in terms of Om and Allah and Yahweh and Christ and Shunyata and the unified field of science, they all converged in this logosphere. And the power points of every point in this field is enormous because it's the calculus of the infinite right here, right now. So when the poet William Blake sees that there's infinity in a grain of sand and eternity in an hour, or when Jesus said, for those who have faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains, or Gandhi standing in that Atma space and tapping the Satya power, the, the Satya Graha, there's a physics here that if we can tap the space of presence, and we, we are the apertures to that. If we can polar shift in this inversion from the ego privileging to the privileging of the Logos, Sophia, that there is a profound shift right here, right now. It's not that we have to leave the planet. It's that sacred Mother Earth is right here before us. We're trampling upon it. And if we have the awakened consciousness, which is a technological shift, uh, whether you call it enlightenment or awakened or whatever words you use, there is a profound shift from the ego-based I-it life to the I-thou sacred life. And it awaits us right here, right now. It's not over there. It's closer to us than we are. With that, if I may, I'd like to move on to our next point. Because I know that we will cover these in greater depth in future programs. But let's come back in full circle to the current day. 
And as I had indicated in my notes, we are certainly in chaotic times. And I'm being the eternal optimist, see massive opportunity out of that. But can we talk about the logos again in terms of the commonalities of cultures, religions, and ideologies today, in this moment today? We can talk about them thousands of years ago, but could you talk about that place and the use of that term in where we are today and how we have become confused, how we have become at war over ideologies where there is no need because at the end of the day they all meet the same point. Would that be a sensible question? That's a beautiful question, David. It's really, in a way, it's the question before us. And uh, picking up on uh, my felt urgent need over decades as a researcher, a logician, and ontologist, I've, 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 and teaching these great texts, I realized in the classroom I had to reinvent teaching and help the students somehow get markers to know when we're speaking the ego-based scripts and so much turns upon this. And when we are entering into the script of uh, a Jesus or a Buddha or a Krishna or a Lao Tzu or even the unified field of, of high science seeking to understand non-locality and the butterfly effect and the fractal nature of reality, all of these converge in a fundamental science and logic. And so the sense of unity that spooks so many people is that the, the fear and the phobia that they might lose their diversity and uniqueness. A Christian who might be threatened in feeling, well, if Jesus is the ultimate truth, and that is my truth, how can I open up to a, a space of the Buddha or of Krishna or of Muhammad without compromising the ultimate truth of my truth? Is it possible that there are different avenues into this unity? So the, there is a phobia of unity as there is an autophobia, a deep phobia of entering oneself. Imagine an autophobia. The ego-based self is in a way terrified of facing its own inner higher self. Again, because of this dimensional shift that Krishna, for example, or Jesus is calling for, the, these teachers all recognize that you have to, in a way, die as a rite of passage to rise into the space. Jesus said, unless you die, you can't be born again. And Krishna is saying to Arjuna, Arjuna, you're going to have to be willing to let go of your ego life and identity to cross into the yoga space. And Buddha saw that it takes profound 24-7 rehab to move from an ego-suffering life into the Buddha space and the Buddha sphere. So that rite of passage is tremendous. And so humanity now, your question is great, where are we now on the planet? Well, how can we find the wherewithal to honor our own unique lifestyle and way of being and religion, let's call it, or discipline as a scientist, and yet acknowledge genuine deep unity in the logosphere. It, it's, it's a traumatic issue because people have not understood, and that's why I use double parentheses to mark unity, deep unity, which flourishes in diversity rather than single bracket unity, which is perverse and tyrannical and reductive of differences. So when people hear the word unity and think of simple, single bracket without, without having that technology to market, they just feel unity is going to compromise my uniqueness and real diversity, and I'm going to hang on to my truth. So single bracket culture is in a culture war, and that's why we get genocides and holocausts and ethnic cleansing, 9-11s and divorces and breakdown of family and across generations, over and over, on and on, the fragmenting and polarizing, and the, the being a culture of war. In contrast to now listening to our great wisdom for centuries and millennia, calling us to an integral script, this inversion to a deeper space, where we can find this boundless diversity in the unity. Unity does not compromise, but it augments and accelerates our profound unity. Everyone is a miracle in this field. Everyone is unique. And if my truth is the truth of Jesus, it grows by recognizing the truth of Krishna or Buddha or science. It is not diminished because the Logos is infinitely deep and infinitely deep in its diversity. That's what people don't understand, apparently. 
And that's the call of America. Let's say the civic space is broken. But if we're one nation under Logos, indivisible, how do we find that Martin Luther King's dream? When he said, I had a dream and we're going to get, I may not get there. I believe he was seeing into the America that is yet to happen. The double bracket America, the sacred space, the civic space in which there can be diversity and multicultural plurality and individual rights, each person sacred, and yet in deep dialogue and the flourishing of a real democracy. We have no choice but to cross that divide now. My goodness me, you have mentioned on several occasions using your markers when you lecture your students. Now this is where for me it gets interesting because it is about finding a narrative for listeners. It is about finding this language you use markers to get over your point to steer your students in the right direction towards understanding all those aforementioned areas the the rite of passage the crossing into the yoga space the infinite possibilities of when you move into that inverted space and i think in many ways if i really put my historian hat on i can look back at the the Dogen civilization in Africa or many others that simply used symbols to communicate or at least to leave a legacy. And then you had other very advanced civilizations who would would write, who would, would uh, scroll. But today, when we're talking about this language, this is, to me, what will change the world. It is the language, and, the, and it's not the language that we have used for so many hundreds of years. It's a in the moment, eye to eye, heart to heart, right brain if you want to use it, approach to finding this different dimension. And in your work, do you look at that different type of language? Do you often ask yourself beyond the marker, and beyond the dialogue in the classroom, that there is an unseen, unknown, wonderful narrative or wonderful language that is just going to appear here that will reverse all of this trauma and take us into this sacred space? Beautiful question, David. And uh, it's a complex one. Uh, just to give you a sense of in the classroom over the decades, as uh, this became clear, and I, and I had to, as I suggested, reinvent teaching and to, and to not just give information to students, but to help them in the Socratic model of a teacher, a midwife, helping them to find their way. As we read these great texts, it became clear that when Buddha speaks, he's not speaking from the single bracket space. He's speaking to it, and he's speaking it from the Buddha space. Or when Krishna, and the reading the dialogue of the Bhagavad Gita, we've got to see that Krishna is speaking from the Om voice, and crossing uh, in a dialogue, and a very problematic dialogue to Arjuna, who is the stand-in ego-based person who is now broken down in his her life. Uh, when Jesus is speaking to his disciples in the Christ space, saying weird things like, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, uh, which is not understood by the, the, the listeners. What I began to help students with, and not only students in the classroom, but colleagues and, and across the academy as I would lecture around the planet, and the leaders that I call together in the forming of the World Commission on Global Consciousness, the Dalai Lama, Desmond Tutu, Jane Goodall, Wangari Matai, uh, Barbara Marks Hubbard, many different leaders who are all at the cutting edge. I find there too that I need to help them see the tools of the double bracket language. It is not another language, it's a deeper dimension of the language we have. There's English in the single bracket, but then there's English in the double bracket. And I said to my colleagues, I don't want to know a lot of languages, single bracket. I want to know English, double bracket, if I could speak English. So if you're going to tr translate the Tao Te Ching and you understand deep English or the logos of English, the point I'm, I'm making is we're not looking for an Esperanto or a missing language. We're trying to tap the logosphere, the origin of our script. The logos is the word. In the beginning is the word. And the logos as a name or the Yahweh or the Allah or the, the Tao, or the Om, all names for this profound language. What is that language? Do I need another sentence? 
if I say this is a pen in ordinary single bracket ego language, and it's just, a, just a, an object, a plastic thing that you write with, but then if I can lift it, and I, I do this demonstration in class, and I lift it into the double bracket space, and I say to my students, look at the pen, check out the pen. And they gasp in a way because they never thought of it that way. They realize the pen in the double bracket space, in the Ohm sphere, in the Yahweh space, in the Christ space, is a magical, fractal, powerful PowerPoint reflecting the entire field right now. And then I pull the pen down and they, I said, would you like to touch this pen? Imagine if it was found on Mars, would it be on headline news? And they saw, yes, of course, it would be a mo monumental discovery that there's writing in another culture and script and the logos, a contact with another world. Well, these mundane objects around us are laden with this mir miraculous meaning if we have the script to decode it right here. So the Zen version of this is that when you say this is mountain in ordinary objectified ego language, it's recognized immediately in the meditative technology the next stage, cross it out. This is not mountain. Mountain is not mountain. But then that's a prelude to reintroducing the sentence in a Zen voice. This is mountain. Double brackets. And wow, the mountain is mountainous. Just as the grain of sand is infinite. Just as a mustard seed is great. Just as the I am is enormous, boundless in its power, spoken right there. So that, to me, is a challenge of literacy for our global age. That is the global script. And it's not another, we don't have to abandon our language to go to another foreign tongue. We need to discover the logos within the language you speak. That was a beautiful response to that question. And when we look at the Ohm, we're looking at the melodies, the tone, the manner, the levels, the color of it. And the reason I keep going down this area of language, is that I believe that with these programs, with panels, it is not necessarily about the articulate nature of it. It is about sending out or broadcasting a huge sense of love and respect. And in that, I think much of it is about being a listener today. I think the one of the other aspects that I look at, particularly over the last hundred years, uh, with a media that has changed significantly in many ways, we have gone away from being able to simply listen, but more about interrupting, uh, about talking to issues that we really are not that qualified to talk about. Maybe we go beyond our own extent of imagination or, or purpose. But then I, I look at this narrative and this language and I, I simply think it is a now about how we resonate, how anybody feels the other end of the phone, the other end of a radio, in, in a situation where you're looking eye to eye. I think it, a lot of it is about that. And I wonder, looking back at past civilizations, whether that was a key as well, that it was much more advanced, that wisdom of how we could connect with each other, human being to human being, that somehow that we lost over these thousands of years and quite possibly to a great extent in the last three to 500 years. Again, beautifully stated, David, and uh, uh, I, I would put a different uh, inflection on the last remarks that whether we've lost it or we are beginning to find it, that sense of deep listening is at the heart and pulse of the shift into the logosphere. All our great teachers understood it. I call it deep dialogue. The dialogue is sacred. That's the I-thou space. So when we are able, if we are able, to make this rite of passage of stepping back from privileging our ego-based consciousness and life and culture making, to dare to enter into the open space of this double bracket I thou encounter, that is a space of deep listening. Opening your heart, listening with your heart and speaking with your heart 
And I feel the Quakers, for example, the founders of the college that we are teach, were masterful in opening up the Quaker meeting space, where you enter the space and you ostensibly check your ego at the door and sit in silence, deep silence, and listen to the word, listen to the logo Sophia, and don't speak from the ego. But when you are moved by the spirit to speak, then you speak out of the spirit to one another. And that is a sacred space of meeting. That is the I thou space. So your remark, and that's why Jesus at one moment of being possibly, uh, you're frustrated saying, for those who have ears, who can listen, let them hear. Uh, Buddha understood that uh, when we're in the Buddha's field uh, and truly listening to one another, we honor, that's respect. That is the Dharma. That is the heart of moral consciousness. To listen respectfully and openly to one another. Don't objectify one another. Don't put your lens on them. Don't lens them to death. It's a form of violence. But to open up in non-violent listening in the art of deep dialogue is to stand before the other with an open space, allowing the other to show herself in her voice. If we can move into that level of culture, which is all the essence of moral consciousness, never objectify another person or yourself, that deep listening is at the heart of the culture we're speaking of. You mentioned Dharma, I believe. Yes. And I look at karma. And sometimes I think that we today are a result of karma because of the many events that have taken place since the Second World War and beyond. We are in the very best spirit to me being taught a lesson. And I think that is what Jesus was about, tough love. Uh, perhaps the tough love today is to take this into a transition for us as a global society and flip us from this egocentric place into an opposing position. And when you talk so eloquently about uh, the way that we react and treat each other, it's a question to me, looking at it globally, because we are a global village today, of how you take that in individuals, because surely the first step is to find ourselves first in order to create that change, but then make it a corporate change. And yes, the, the internet and technology and communications will surely help, but it goes beyond that, does it not? There's something to take that sense of being in the sacred reality of pursuing everything that we've talked to today and sharing that globally to where it becomes like a set of dominoes to where they fall and everybody becomes one. Is that something that resonates? Am I defining that well? No, well, well spoken, David, and uh, it is it does resonate. And with uh, several of the uh, groups of uh, pioneering leaders with whom I'm working, like the evolutionary leaders, calling the planet, the human family, to conscious evolution, to upscript into this sacred space, or the World Commission on Global Consciousness, that's what global consciousness is, or the World Wisdom Council, suggesting that there is a global wisdom across the planet. And we are at the tipping point, as I work with uh, Irvin Laszlo, his book called Tipping Point, we're at a tipping point where we've got to somehow help the planet in a way to go viral, a tsunami of light uh, across the planet. And this is where internet can be a great supporter and instrument in helping to call the people into a higher civic shared polis or political space. Uh, the way you articulated your question about karma and dharma, Dharma, in the Buddha sense, is the moral law. It's a name for the Buddha field. Uh, but it's, again, insofar as it's a global space, whether it's the Christ space or the, the, the Sufi space of, of, of Muhammad uh, and Allah, uh, however we name that sacred space, it, it has a, a scientific tenor and tone of this uh, wonderful, respectful, mutual dealing with each other and with the environment as a human family. 
And on the planet now, uh, we're facing the karmic consequences, as you rightly point out. The karma, rightly understood, is when you're living an ego-based culture and life, individually and collectively, the karma is really all of the information that you bundle yourself into. I'll give you my identity. It's my identity. And if I make myself an object with all of this information, and that is my story, and I am that story, that is my karma, the information I carry. And even death doesn't burn it off. That's why I have to work on this over and over until I burn it off and let go of that, that karmic consequences. But what is the collective karma on the planet today and the tough love that you rightly speak of? Gaia, Mother Earth, the environment, is presenting us some tough love consequences of unsustainability, whether it is a melting polar ice cap or, or the rising uh, levels of the ocean or the loss of topsoil or the shortage of water or the threat of nuclear you know, annihilation and the increased disparity in economic distribution of wealth and injustice there. All of these crises we're facing by the great wisdom are known to scientifically emerge from that calculus of objectification and fragmentation. People seem not to have gotten that link yet, that the essence of our global wisdom is pay attention to the calculus we're using to make our worlds, ourselves, and our political spaces and our cultures. And if we can get that link and get that connection and see, oh my God, my using my mind egoically is causing and contributing to the enormous karmic crises we're facing, which threaten our survival and sustainability at this time on the planet. It's often said that this generation will be the first to decide if we're the last generation. That's a huge thing to say. But that's the moment and the opportunity to face our karmic consequence that has been emerging for millennia. It's not an overnight thing, or even in the last century. It's been building as long as we've been the ego-based ego culture. So to wrap that point up, the movement into the Dharma, into this humane space, the sacred space, that is going to really burn off that crippling karma, individual and collective, you're quite right. It must be, each person must look in the mirror and ask, am I egoing? Am I therefore contributing to the pollution of the ecology of my culture and my life internally and interpersonally and interculturally and globally? And we have to take responsibility for that. And there can be a wonderful viral, so to speak, connecting of the people, we the people, to understand that it's time to grow up. We have to go from what I would call ego pillars to Buddha flies, to play with that a bit. It is really it's an evolutionary upscript of our human essence. We have to be persons now. And a true person is a double bracket, awakened, sacred human who is living in that compassion of the Dharma. We are coming close to the end of the program. And one thing that I wanted to drop in there, listening to that response, was I remember two and a half years ago when I began this broadcasting, for some reason on the website, one of the first things that I wrote, <coughs> and not knowing why, I wrote on there that we're the generation of all generations. And I really didn't know why I wrote it then, but there was obviously a reason but you have talked about this as a generational issue and talk about the crystal children now, the, the new generations. But for some reason, I keep looking at this in terms of responsibility and intuitively that our generation is fundamentally important possibly like never before, in finally taking this responsibility, not defaulting to the next generation, and guiding these youngsters to find the way. Is that being melodramatic, or is it exaggerating this, or do you think in part that that could be the case in our responsibility today? That's well said, uh, David. And I think that is a tone of, of the, the different groups of leaders that I'm collaborating with. Uh, certainly the, world, uh, you know, the evolutionary leaders, about 60 uh, of these light awakened beings, uh, each uh, who uh, he and she have really uh, established a powerful leadership reputation on the planet in, in this respect. 
they all feel now that we pass it on this generation is not the younger generation the young age wise but we're in this together the the, the seniors the elders the the the, the holders of, of of the wisdom the young brilliant ones coming along we're one and there is a consensus that we've reached a point of unsustainability that is frightening and also intriguing uh, because the crisis is an opportunity where we must evolve in order to be sustainable and sustain ourselves. And as frightening as it may appear, there is a sense of we've reached the tipping point. And this generation, meaning age group K through 90, all of us are in this together now. And we need to respect one another and take joint responsibility is a word you use. We have to take responsibility. If I'm participating day by day, hundreds and thousands of times in ego minding my way through my day and life, am I contributing to the pollution and desecration of the space of our culture and our earth? And therefore, directly, scientifically contributing to the crises that are in our face and are threatening our sustainability and even survival. There's a sense that it has peaked now. So I think your intuition and your sense that, it, that this is a unique generational moment in the widest sense of generation. And I, I find as a teacher that, and as a, a parent, as a grandparent, looking at the young ones, that there is a, a kind of wisdom in them, if we can, if we can not stifle it out, that is beginning to show up. Whether we talk about indigo children or whatever, I don't want to necessarily go there, but I think uh, child is father to the man, as the great poet said, that our children are born as sacred beings, and if we have the cultural space to hold that sacred child and nurture him, her, in the technology of our great spiritual teachers of the centuries, and to hold that, protect them from being folded up and cultified by the single bracket culture surrounding them. That will be, that is our responsibility to our young ones, uh, not to have them violated and packaged that way. Uh, and, and so that sense of responsibility is in our face now, and it is a matter of life and death for tending to our children and our grandchildren on this planet. And I go back one step, and I'm only going to take a two degree change here from the middle of the road, uh, but you did hint at this. And I placed it in my notes that Bolivia is a very interesting country in creating the earth law where, as I had suggested in the notes, they are creating a parity and equality between Mother Earth, Gaia and human beings. And I see this as being a great step and it's not perfect. There is as much corruption, I believe, there is as anywhere else. But they are making great strides and this is something that we should also look at i believe in ensuring that mother earth is as conscious as human beings and every other living thing in this universe and there should be far more emphasis placed upon not just uh, building green fields as they talk about but cherishing mother earth in everything that we do and everything that we think is that part of this scenario now going forwards that is absolutely essential quite right david and well said and i think that that uh, experiment is ex right on the mark in terms of the the, the logosphere uh, the, the logic of the logosphere the sophia sphere is that our bodies are sacred we're temples and if we recognize that it's not my body, but, but, but to, to, to be embodied. And, and, and the earth is the embodiment of, of the Logosophia. And if we really recognize that just scientifically, when we say infinity in a grain of sand, it, it, it is a miraculous point that everything around us is sacred. It is the body of Sophia. So when we rake the leaves, when we tend to nature, when we turn off the lights, when we're careful with water, when we drink with consciousness, when we eat the food with thanksgiving, that's the ethos of the awakened human who is understanding that everything around us, including ourselves, our bodies, sacred temples, and that's what's being called for in this awakened culture. So yes, I think 
the, the Gaia has awakened, if we realize the science that in every cell, in every atom, in every speck of reality, it is the manifestation of the infinite field. It's, you can't get away from that. You can't break a piece of Om off. If you break a piece of Om off, what you're going to get is Om. So the infinite field that surrounds us, the basic science, is that every point is a sacred point, and therefore filled with the presence of Sophia. What more life can there be in Gaia? That takes us just to a point, because I'd like to talk about Sophia, because there will be many listeners who do not have that information, that background, that, that context. Uh, and also with that, if you may, I would like to talk about the masculine and feminine. Some talk about the left and right brain, uh, masculine and feminine. And of course, you can talk to some and they are very unclear, don't have the clarity or the background to understand what exactly you mean about that masculine feminine. Clearly, something that was lost over the centuries and I do fully resonate and understand your prior remark that it's not about losing uh, it's just not there and it will return could you kindly put that into context uh, the Sophia the feminine and in that how that plays a part in where we are going now in terms of the the, the, the culture that packages logos the word reason uh, coming out of the Greek tradition, uh, when you begin to objectify it, it becomes the logos and reason and reasoning and technical logic and information packaged in the box, uh, so to speak. Uh, it really is seen to be logocentric. It's become a bad thing because the feminine is displaced and it becomes more patriarchal uh, rationality and so forth. But going back to the, the wisdom of the teachers, who uh, uh, seek to open up the literacy of the deep field. The logos, I use the word logosophia as one word. Whether it's the yin-yang, the male-female, or the, the complementarity, not the polarity, but the complementarity. And so if we speak of left brain, right brain, the analytical brain and the, the intuitive brain, and one is more female and the other one more male, I don't quite buy that that way of putting it, because in the double bracket space, what is polarized below, and even at odds, like male versus female in the single bracket culture space, becomes in a profound meeting point when we go into the sacred space. So the, the, the pulse of the sacred energy is Logosophia as one. The yin-yang are not two, they're two in one. And so there's a depth of the gender, and Carl uh, Gustav Jung uh, breaking from Freud with Freud and touching a little of yoga, began to develop in his language of psycho, psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, in the analysis of the psyche, that every psyche has uh, anima animas, male and female, which is a kind of startling thing for, a, say, a man to hear, that there's a female energy within you. If you're an anima, the animas, an anima is within you, and the key to becoming a whole being, a whole integral person, is to bring those two energy fields together. So I would rather speak of a holistic brain, not the bicameral brain. It, of course, there are two sides, and, and, but really it is one integral holistic brain and a holistic intelligence. And so the two faces of that, male-female, yin-yang, logosophia, shiva-shakti, all of the cultures, there's a global language of the comp complementarity of the two. So every female has to somehow come to terms with the male energy within her and vice versa. And that is almost the, 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 the play of dialogue. The alchemy of dialogue is that I and thou, the other is fully other, standing over against me, before me. And yet, in the meeting of dialogue and sacred space, the two can be in one, in consensus. Dialogos, through the logos, we can find that unity and community in our diversity. And so I think this is a way that I would want to situate the, the challenge of gender. And women from Venus and men from Mars are different worlds. In a single bracket culture, they may seem to be worlds apart and beyond communication and meeting. But in the sacred place of love, not when they're objects for each other, but when they're I-thou in the sacred space of love. That's where you meet your lover, in the intimacy 
of alterity or difference, profoundly other, and yet capable of meeting and, and, and finding communion. This, I think, would be best summed up in the word balance. Yes. You know, in, in the past, I, I, I can read great scholars who will talk about good and evil, dark and light, uh, male and female. I, I have come to the definite conclusion that uh, one without the other will never work. You will always have both. They are required. It is n not that that is the issue to me. What is the issue in finding this next evolutionary stage that we've been talking about is the balance. It seems the balance that is what we're looking for. Or does it go further than that? Or can I better define it than that? No, that's well said, David. I'll just put a, a different a tur turn on balance, harmony, music, uh, the meeting, the dance, the Shiva Shakti da dance, the unity of lovers, however we, we word it, uh, that yes, it's in that space of balance as you put it, uh, of sacred meeting, that the higher culture is going to emerge. My final point in our notes, as you may remember, was the issue of meditation. And, and I had left this, left us with 10 or 20 minutes here at the end of the program to talk about this. I think it's fundamentally important. And I, I think that it can be talked about in terms of where people are situated. And I had suggested in the notes they could be on a high mountaintop, they could be uh, in a valley or in a mega city. And to me, the meditation doesn't need to change wherever they are. I think because we are in a material world and thinking as such today, there's a disparity or a misunderstanding of what meditation is dependent upon the venue that we are geographically based in. And the many people believe that they have to find a coastline to fully become involved or fully become entrenched into the different reality that we're talking about. But to me, we should be able to find that meditation's position anywhere we're at. How would you best define the way for people to find that place wherever they are? That's, again, a wonderful question, David. And by the way, I just want to add a, a tag on to the last question about balance between the gender issues. The, one of the m mantras we hear around the mark of the great shift is goddess coming around, the goddess is coming around, the rise of the feminine and so forth. But again, to pick up and not lose that point, the balance issue, that the rise of the feminine cannot be without the rise of the, the, the male as well. They have to co-arise together and each playing off in this dialogue dance that each augmenting, so with the feminine rising, the, 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 the Shiva power, the, the male rising, comes with it together. Uh, and they, they rise together, uh, each augmenting one another in their alterity and diversity. I just wanted to get that uh, sense of the, the new challenge of a higher uh, dialogue dance of, the, of those two principles. But your point about med meditation is right on. People often don't understand that we have images of the, the yogi meditating, so to speak, and chanting Om and sitting in a certain posture. But the higher advanced understanding of the technology of meditation is that it, it occurs 24-7 in every moment in life, in every locus. The objective is to enter into this logosphere, this Om sphere, this yogic technology of living, this Christ living, the Buddha living, the scientific awareness living, where you realize wherever you are, entering into presence, awareness of presence is the heart of meditation. And so when the Zen person would say, when you chop wood, chop wood, double bracket. When you carry water, carry water. When you sit, sit. When you speak, speak. When you eat, eat. All the, t the tone of voice, meaning every mundane activity in every walk of life, when you enter the workplace, when you go into the marketplace, when you go to shop, when you go into the cafeteria, when you sip your coffee, when you meet your lover, when you encounter your colleague, always sacred culture of showing up in the moment. That's a meditative moment. And so when I'm teaching in the class here at the college, 
and I'm teaching the meditative texts, I call the classroom a laboratory, a lab, a thinking, entering lab where we have to meditate together, collectively, in that space as we enter the text of Buddha or the text of Krishna or read Descartes' meditations, which, by the way, has been grossly misread and misunderstood uh, because Descartes, when he said, I am, was moving into the meditative space. He was in meditations. So, yes, I think the technology, the democratization of meditation, we have a right to meditate. We have a right to be. We have a right to be in presence. We have a right to shine. And that is the flourishing of well-being. And well-being is a happiness. So the meditative life is a one of being mindful in the moment, in whatever we do, in our work, our play, our love, in all of all that we do. Great question. I remember Joseph Campbell making the statement, your sacred space is where you can find yourself again and again. And I, I did ask that question because so many people in my world are in flight because they cannot find themselves or the world that we are so aspiring to finding where they are. They feel that they have to move or relocate to find that space where they can meditate. I have my own uh, expression for that and guidance. What would you say to people that would resonate with Joseph Campbell's statement there where any space is sacred? Well, I would uh, resonate completely with it. I think it's, it's exactly right. And uh, again, to realize uh, that when you're speaking the two dimensional languages, when you speak the ego language and I'm saying, I'm here now, I'm sitting in the cafe or I'm here in a noisy football field or whatever it may be, that language, that here is blocked with a, with a limited lens. But to open up and dilate the heart mind in your body to realize that's the meditative term, that I am in presence, I'm always in presence, it's wherever I am. And that's the sacred space. Wherever I am is sacred. Because Sophia is here. Logo Sophia is infinitely here. So to have the access code and the password, and everyone must do it, a, mom, a mother can't do it for you. Each person must find her own access code and password into the aperture of presence, into the sacred space. And that when we are and hold that space, that's when we flourish and shine. And that is the call of the high culture. Just referring back to the dialogical culture, how can we best use that to obtain not only that meditation individually, but also corporately and how to attain in the material world today the balance between a corporate world an individual world a spiritual world a world that is not separated by ideology how can that dialogical process best serve well said i think uh, i i i to speak to that, I formed an institute about 15 years ago called the Global Dialogue Institute to help bring the technology of deep dialogue out to the culture at all levels in education, in politics, in peacemaking, in human relations, in the workplace, in the play place, everywhere around. The art of dialogue uh, really is at the heart of it. So your, your question is, is well taken. And, and so uh, in raising our children, to, to help them understand the, the, the literacy of dialogue uh, in, in every detail, just gently to help them be sensitive to the other and to the environment and to the resources and not to slam the door because grandmother is sitting right there. Listen to her, attend to her and to, to move in the world, not to tiptoe, but to move graciously into the world and the ecology. That is raising a child as a dialogical being. And in, our, in, in every meeting uh, that we encounter 24-7 with our significant other partner, our lover, or the workers that we meet in our workspace, or the persons who come to collect the garbage, so to speak, uh, in, our, uh, in our yard, uh, to, to, to honor them. That's a dialogue moment. It, it, is, it is sacred acknowledgement of the other. And there's a cultural way of presenting oneself 
uh, locally in your own lifestyle. But then when it takes into the collective space and the, the political space, imagine now if America is a, is a democracy and the civic space is a multicultural space and we're going to go and enter into and to realize we the people are the ones who hold the, the, the power in self-governance. And it requires a culture of dialogue, of deep dialogue with one another to respect difference and yet speak honorably and openly and allow the possibility of rapport, rapprochement and meeting of minds on possible consensus in that diversity. It's so it's, it, what you rightly say, whether it's my individual life within myself, and please note that each person within herself has to practice the art of dialogue. Suppose I'm raised as a Christian and I believe the biblical world, but I'm also a physicist and I see the Big Bang is true and I do my science. I'm a civic American and I'm trying to keep the ecumenical civic space respected and to be careful how I bring my religion into that civic space. And I'm practicing yoga and I'm chanting Om and I'm doing Feng Shui in my apartment and I'm seeing the alternative medicine with the acupuncture. How do I bring those multiple selves and energy fields together? I have to have inner dialogue to become integral and whole and, and to be in that inner sacred space. So it's both intra and inter in every act of our lives. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, as we do come to the end of the program soon, don't quote me on this, but I believe it was Emerson who said that spiritual force was far stronger than material force. And I, I think that is one of the things that people are up against today. And I think that that is another transition, a leap of faith for people to take. And over and beyond that, I also see this world as being an extractive one, Ashok. It is extractive in nature, in financial circles. It's extractive in our everyday transactions. It's, it's extractive politically. It's extractive with Mother Earth. All of those put together, if they can be eliminated, as well as the thinking process that comes along with that material world, then this is what seems to me is going to meet everything that you were talking about just now in the way that we can treat each other. I guess to sum it up, an unconditional love. I think it's a great word, unconditional love, because that is a sacred space of dialogue and ethics in our engagement with ourselves and, and each other. When you say extractive, I imagine you mean, you, you're meaning that you, you're extracting, you're taking it, for your own, uh, you know, more limited perspective, uh, li literally extracting the essence out of uh, out of nature, you know, mastering nature, objectifying her, and so uh, in every walk of our life, if the, if the word extractive or to put it differently, reductive, objectifying, treating as an object, right? Once we treat everything as an object, including ourselves, in the ego-based consciousness, it does lead to what we call the material universe, but. I think the, the, the heart of the, that materialistic outlook is the technology of ego-based living and thinking, in contrast to the spiritual space, uh, of, uh, which is a scientific space of being in the unified field where everything is interconnected and flowing in the zone. So the original remark, whether it's Emerson or whomever said it, it's a global truth that the spiritual force is the greatest force, if you understand it as a force of presence, of the force of the unified field. And this has been noticed in so many ways when Gandhi spoke of the Satya Graha. Graha is force, Satya is truth. And to tap the Om space, the Christ space, the Buddha space, the unified field, the science is enormous. Because if we have the access code to touch that point, and if there's that of God in every person, as the Quakers, for example, say, then imagine what that means. It means that can you reach that point within yourself and allow that to shine? That's enormous force. That's the power of one. So a great genius is what we see that could stand up like a Gandhi or a Mother Teresa who had enormous power. Where did they get it? They were tapping that deep space within, that deep space, which is what? The space of dialogue, the sacred space of connectivity and interconnectivity and flow in contrast to the extractive mentality that takes and wants and accumulates and hoards and so forth, a life of scarcity. So putting in economic terms, if you could live a life in the double bracket space, 
that is the space of the flow of abundance and, and force and presence and love and connectivity. That's abundance. What would money be like in the logosphere? I call it logonomics. And what is money in the extractive space? Egonomics, ego-based money, ego-based culture, ego-based economy. We, we, we're possessive and we're grabbing things and purchasing, accumulating money. As much money, ego money, as one may have, one can still be poor. And that's why Jesus said, render to Caesar what is Caesar and render to God what is God's. But pointing to the two economies. So if we're going to move to a planet of abundance, uh, which of course means the abundance of food and material conditions for people to flourish, that's what I'm talking about. The economy and the space and culture of abundance is the space of deep dialogue, living in presence, which is, releases profound forces. And our teachers have known that. And just to complement that, as we come to the end of the program, I do have two final questions. With that guidance in place for people, and we have been crafted our generations by the great individuals, including Gandhi, King, uh, many others. Would it be fair to say also to people that there is no reason why they cannot be leaders some of the time, that you cannot rule out the idea that if functional giving in a karmic way that will create this abundance and bring back to you all of the best that you could ever wish for, that in that process, nobody is going to stop you from being a leader some of the time when it is appropriate and when you can shine. And I wonder whether in the past, whether we have seeked to have one individual leader where Yes, that may be the case in certain domains, but we could say to people, look, you can be the leader when it is appropriate. People will come to you for your skills and you will be the leader for that period. Would that be another good way to look at the way that people can interact together? Uh, yes, absolutely right. I would word it slightly differently. I think our great teachers were saying when, when Jesus said to his disciples, you will do far more than I. When Buddha in his parting words uh, said ostensibly, don't follow me, be a lamp unto yourself, work out your salvation and awakening with diligence. He was recognizing a, a universal global law. That that's the power of one. Each person as a sacred being, when she stands in her power, it's a whole co new concept of leadership. Each point is a PowerPoint. And it doesn't have to be on the news. It doesn't have to be recognized by a, a vast uh, number of people. It can be a quiet moment by herself where she's shining in that moment, paying it forward without fanfare, without attention. She can uh, give and, and tend to the suffering or the needs of others without expecting payback. And we're called to be leaders not on occasion, in the sense of stepping into the center stage, but to realize the calculus of the unified field of the Logosophia sphere. Every point is omic, every point is fractal, every point is powerful. We're called to be leaders. And as Kant, the philosopher, said in the moral community, each person is at once a royal legislator, but also a subject, subjecting herself to the law the Dharma, which is autonomous, autonomy, freedom. So we're being called to be a sacred being, and that is to shine in your lights. And when each of us shine in our unique lights, we're being leaders. And that is really what our call is now in this next stage of our cultural evolution. I am surely grateful in the way that you articulated that. We come to the end of this first program together and I would ask you finally looking back over your career and with the many years that you have ahead of you with this what are your greatest memories and greatest achievements or possibly better stated what are the greatest moments that you have been involved in which have made you realize that this world has such abundance uh, such opportunities 
those moments that assured you that there was much to look forward to? Well, well, that's a great question. That could take a while. And I know we're at the end of our conversation for this one. And uh, I, I, I suppose there, there, there are so many PowerPoints in my life that I look back. And one was as a boy walking in New York City delivering alcohol bottles to people who call in to the liquor stores part-time after school. And I didn't, I was naive, of course, 14, 15 years old, walking the streets of New York, looking up at these buildings and people. And when I would get to the different apartments, I didn't know what an alcoholic was or a person who was not even ready to come out to buy the liquor. And I, I just felt people were not well, they were suffering. And I would look up at the apartment one day walking with a, a, a delivery on Amsterdam Avenue in the Upper West Side and trying to hold in one consciousness the many different apartment windows and wondering who is behind that suffering and what are they feeling and without losing that person that I visualized another and another and by the third or fourth when I stopped for a red light I found my hair standing up and I began to feel what is that I'm feeling and I didn't even know what it was and the next morning I spontaneously started to write follow the universal light, seek the light, live in the light. And I didn't even know what that was about, but I was writing it. And it took, this was well before any real engagement with philosophy and the decades uh, of my unfolding. Uh, and it took me years until I began to see teaching here at the college, uh, the, these great teachers who were the light and spoke from the light and the, the, the technology of entering the light that when I began to finally name the single bracket, which was a high point in my journey, to realize that we need to somehow help the people understand that we are using ego script and that that is being singled out as the single most profound effect and creating the dissonance and fragmentation and suffering in our human condition. And our teachers were seeing that, but it was not yet brought out. And that to use the double brackets to mark the deep common logos technology that they were calling us to, to recognize that there was a deep technology, a script that they were all trying to help humanity find and to mark those out. As that emerged for me over the past 20 years in my teaching and my performance around the planet, I began presenting it to the people and seeing them light up when they would say, I knew this, but you've given me the words and the vocabulary to express it. That, I think, was, if I have to name one moment uh, or, or, or evolution in my life that gave me enormous hope and even awareness and confidence that our human family is ready to rock and roll together. It is that. Ashok Kumar Gankadeen, Professor of Philosophy at Haverford College in Pennsylvania and Director Founder of the Global Dialogue Institute. It has been an enormous pleasure to share this time with you in this first program. Learned much and it's been a great honor and certainly look forward to our future programs together. David, thank you. Wonderful questions and you held the space as a host beautifully. So thank you. It's an honor to be with you. And to our listeners today, I do hope that you enjoyed this program as much as I. You can gain information on this and any other program in the series at davidgibbons.org. Meanwhile, wherever you are in this world, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening.